So excited to have this opportunity to speak with Adam Hustler. Adam, you're joining me from England. How are you doing today? Oh, good. Yeah, we've got a very busy life at the moment. We live outside of London. That bit's very relaxed. Uh, but going into London is a little bit more hectic. We've got a little baby who's now eight months old. Oh, congratulations. We, thank you. We're traveling and teaching a lot. So we got back from Ireland on Sunday evening, quite late. And tomorrow morning, we're traveling to a French island called Corsica to teach at a festival. So yeah, things are quite busy at the moment and the house is just a mess and we're trying to juggle projects. So I'm good, but busy. Oh man, well, thank you so much for niching out some time to speak with me here. I really do appreciate it. I have two children as well, and I, I completely understand the amount of work that you're going, mm -hmm. going through with an eight-month-old. That's so incredible. Um, so are you, what are you going to be doing when you said you go to Corsica? You're going to be teaching at a festival, you said? Yeah, so tra traveling as a yoga teacher, uh, I think for anyone who's a new teacher, you know, you see lots of people that call themselves like international teachers and the like. Uh, and that could mean many things, couldn't it? An international teacher. It could mean someone that's been on holiday once and taught a yoga class so it could be someone who's on the road uh, and it can be it can seem quite glamorous and I think a lot of yoga teachers get drawn into the our new yoga teacher get drawn to the idea of want to be in a traveling teacher it's really hard work and there's it's not that easy to do you know the kind of teaching that I do is you know teaching conferences uh, teaching workshops teaching trainings this thing this weekend is actually a small uh, small festival uh, and yeah, it seems very glamorous and it is, it, you know, it is lovely, but sometimes, especially pre-COVID when I was traveling every weekend, it was really hard. Like you, you, I would fly out of London sometimes on a Saturday morning after teaching a class, end up in some city in Europe, teach a workshop, go to bed, wake up, teach another three workshops, go to the airport, come back Sunday night. <laughs> and then uh, Monday morning would start teaching again in London. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be able to, you know, send my offering out there, but it is, it's pretty, it's pretty hard work. And so now as a, as a, as a parent, I'm trying to tone it down a little bit. I've got no desire to yeah. you know, go away for two weeks. Uh, I've got no desire to travel every weekend. And when I do travel where possible, I want to take my little baby with me and my wife with me, who's an amazing sound healer. So what we do kind of combines quite well. Wonderful. Are you traveling as a family together this weekend or are you off? Yeah, so, so this one's a funny one. So this one actually, you know, because sometimes you know, festivals and conferences can pay very well. Sometimes you're doing it more for exposure, like the pay is okay, but you're doing it more for the, you know, the, reach, the outreach. Yeah. This one is actually a much smaller one. And the reason I'm doing it is I've never been to Corsica. Uh, and I just wanted a little holiday. Like my obligation is to teach literally two hours of yoga. So we're there from Wednesday night to Sunday. And it just means that my wife and I can have a little bit of downtime, uh, relax. You know, we, we won't be doing any yoga because everything's in French, except me. Everything's in French and I don't speak French. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're just going to chill out. And so it's a nice I... little family, family adventure. Yeah. That does sound amazing. How are you adjusting to traveling with an eight month old? Like, what are you finding getting on the airplane with a baby? Do you ever have that uh, anticipation of like, oh man, if my baby really cries the whole way, how will so I do we, it? <laughs> we've been on four flights now. So yeah, we've been to Sweden with him and Ireland. That's it. Yeah. Not particularly long flights. That's yeah. the benefit of living in Europe. You get to go to vastly different places within two hours, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so we haven't been any long flights, but on all the flights we've been on, it's been fantastic. Oh, like nice. he's, a very, he's a very smiley, happy baby. And I think part of that, of why he's so cheery, at least at the moment, is you know, Holly and I are both quite calm. I'm a yoga teacher. She's a yogi and a sound healer. And we live in a cottage in the countryside. And you know, we're very proactive parents. We want to, you know, we're constantly with him, you know, nurturing him. So, and all he's known is love. Uh, like we, we don't argue particularly in our household. Uh, the grandparents are very kind and calm and lovely. Yeah. yeah, he's just a very calm, social baby. And the only reason he ever really cries is if he wants food, I'm always <laughs> tired. So it was a bit, of, not a nightmare, but on the way back from Ireland, it was quite late, way yeah. past his bedtime. So the flight was fine, but then getting him into a taxi, 
and then transfer, you know, that was all quite exhausting. He was quite upset by that. Yeah. Uh, but that's because he was tired. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Have you mastered the art of traveling minimalism style in relation to carrying everything that you need? Or do you find that you're, you know, you have the the pram, the, uh, you know, all the things that are going with you or have you balanced that? Do you know what my, my view is? My priority is keeping the baby safe and comfortable. That's a priority. Yeah. And there's, we haven't had to compromise particularly and think, oh, we, you know, can we get the pram in? Like if we're concerned, we just make we just make it happen. So if we're concerned about can it fit into a taxi the other side, we just get a bigger taxi. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to make sure he's comfortable. So I want to make yeah. sure everything with him he's safe. So we've just bought a big travel cot because right. actually we had an experience in Dublin the weekend where they provided a travel cot but no mattress and didn't tell us until we got there. So I spent the first three hours in Dublin running around on a friday night trying to buy a mattress <laughs> yeah. right so actually let's put as much as we can let's put things back in our control even if it costs money yeah and so yeah, yeah. today we just had a big travel cot delivered <laughs> oh yeah nice adam can you share with me how you first got in contact with yoga yeah so this, this whole career was never the plan you know i was supposed to be a lawyer i try, i was training to be a lawyer I think my first real contact was at uni. So I was a boxer at uni. That's not what I studied, but I was boxing as an amateur boxer. Uh, and I think I got first introduced at like a, fa I was doing some modeling, like a university fashion show. And I did a bit of stretching as part of the warm up, like some girl that wasn't a yoga teacher, but knew some stuff about yoga, was warming us up in a way that like a, a naive 18 year old person would. <laughs> None of us know what we're doing. Uh, and I was like, actually, this stretching could be quite good. And so I started to just do it. Like no one else really knew I was doing it, but I was doing, I would guess now call it yoga inspired stretching. And I was doing that, you know, in my dorm room, uh, just you know, following bits on YouTube or just reading about some stretches. I don't know, actually, was YouTube a thing then? I don't think it maybe was. <laughs> somehow. Yeah, I know it feels like it's been here forever, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> somehow I had access to some stretching uh, and I was doing some like yoga stretching you know, and I found it actually made my boxing better. It made my recovery better. Nice. Uh, I wasn't really into the meditative components. When I moved back to my hometown after university, uh, I was going through quite a stressful time. I didn't really know my career direction, going through a breakup. And I started to you know, read lots of Hellenistic philosophies, which you know, massive overlap with yoga philosophy. Uh, and so in some sense, I was meditating. And then I thought, you know, what can I do to meet people in this home city? Uh, I was boxing, but that didn't really help meet people. You know? yeah. <laughs> Not entirely yeah. the kind of... Uh, and then <laughs> I, I was working in the charity sector at that point. And again, wasn't the kind of place to meet people you want to go out with and have fun with and shared interests. And I thought, you know, shall I do some dancing? I don't know why. Or shall I go to like some yoga classes? Because uh, I was still doing some informal yoga. But I thought, shall I formalize it and start going to a class? And at the place I was, there was some hot yoga. And I would go there half an hour early, lie in the room, read my philosophy books, nice. do my yoga. And it always felt good, no matter what. I always felt really good after the class. You know, and I was at that point, like a 21-year-old with an eight-pack, like super yeah. fit, super athletic. Yeah. Was, you know, I was being competitive. I was yeah. trying to compete with the yeah. people next to me. And the, the one woman next to me, I remember, was actually part of Birmingham Royal Ballet. Uh, and of course, I couldn't win. Uh, <laughs> I tried. I tried. Uh, and yeah, that's how I ended up doing it for the first time. Uh, mm. And then I was doing it almost like four times, five times a week. And yeah, and that was, how many years ago was that? That was like 14, 15 years ago. Yeah, you just got hooked. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's cool. I, I read that you also have been involved in some endurance events, like a long distance running race. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is actually the real, something's happening for me at the moment. And this is actually a topic that's on my mind in that I think suffering is really important. Uh, and when I say, uh, of course, we all go through suffering. You know, Ducker is a big part of life. We're all going to suffer. Uh, but we don't choose suffering that much anymore. Mm. Uh, there isn't that much day-to-day -day suffering like, oh, am I going to find food? There is for some people, of course. But for many people, we live fairly comfortable lives. And I realize I don't have that because, you know, I'm now a dad and I've got lots of work projects on. I don't do anything that really challenges me anymore. 
you know, yoga practice, you know, I've softened my yoga practice a little bit. And I miss that. And I miss having the ability to challenge myself and really go through a microcosm of life, let's say. Yeah. On the running track or in a, one of the races I did was like 12 hours, a 12 hour, 100 kilometer race. Oh, yeah. I miss that. And so that's why I used to do these things is number one, I wanted to challenge myself, you know, loads of marathons, ultras. Uh, and then number two, it was a nice way to see the world. And I guess number three is I like to do stuff that other people couldn't. Mm. Uh, I don't know what, what, why, but I, you know, I wanted to try and do things that other people couldn't. And I feel that if I, were, if, if I was that age now, you know, I'd probably be doing it on a much bigger level. Uh, this was all pre-social media. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. now, now that fitness is on trend, you know, I'd look back thinking, you know, I was coming third in some of these kind of Spartan races. Yeah. Uh, I was doing, and, and I wish it happened now. But anyway, uh, so that's why I did this kind of endurance stuff. And yoga helped me through these endurance things. But I, I want to find something now to do that can offer me that kind of challenge. I feel quite soft in yeah. many senses, like a bit of a soft belly. There's no eight pack anymore. Also, <laughs> also a bit, a bit weak, Ment not mentally, but in, yeah. I, I need something to kick my ass a little bit. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I hear you on that. I, I recently uh, kicked my ass really good these last three years and got involved in an event called crossing for cystic fibrosis. And uh, we, we paddle our paddle boards from Bimini in the Bahamas across the Gulf Stream, 80 miles back to Florida. And wow. so it's like a 14 to 16 hour event. But after this last one, I feel like I turned a corner where I suffered so much that I feel like, okay, I, I don't want to suffer right now. <laughs> so I, I totally understand what you're saying. Like I, I fully, and, and then I was thinking, I, I, I want to push myself. I want to push myself, but my body after this one has gotten to a point where I started to get a little scared that maybe I went a little too far, a little mm. too hard. Have you, have you had any bouts with injury and, or. I've um, broken lots. You know, my nose is all mushy. I've broken me. Being a boxer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a serious I, thing to step into a ring. I, I just can't imagine the, 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 how it's, it's that, would, that would scare the crap out of me. Yeah. It, it, it's a good thing for everyone to, I think, do to have that, that kind of encounter. Yeah. Like have someone that's, you know, wanting to take your head off and being in the ring with them. It certainly brings, <laughs> yeah. you, into present, it brings you into the present moment more than warrior two. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I, you know, I never stopped doing those endurance events because I had an injury. It mm. was simply time. Yeah. It was, you know, I was training. boxing, running, doing all these marathons. Then I started teaching more and more. And suddenly I had a full-time job, which is almost 60 hours, and teaching 11 classes a week on top of that. Yeah. Something had to go. Yeah. And the thing that went was well, the fitness, all the fitness yeah. stuff. You know, so at yeah. one, you know, when I was teaching 26 classes a week at one point, like, I was still toned. I was really just quite skinny. I could do lots of arm balances because I wasn't carrying any weight. Yeah. Uh, but looking back at photos, I'm like shocked at how <laughs> yeah. scrawny, at scrawny I look. So that was the only reason. It wasn't due to any injury. It wasn't due to lack of desire. It was just due to limited time. And yeah. then since then, I've been quite lucky, but I've worked hard to make sure my job, my role as a yoga teacher has grown and grown. I've taught all over the world. Things are going well. well things are going really well before COVID. You know, a little bit... A little bit different now. Everything's changed yeah. in the yoga world post-COVID. Yeah. Yeah. The studios yeah. closing, work international workshops much quieter. People doing more yoga from home and just not wanting to go to yoga studios anymore. Yeah. You know, all of these yeah. things have happened. Yeah. But I think everyone should find something that helps build grit. Yeah. Uh, whatever that might be, and of course, it needs to be appropriate to the amount of time you have and your fitness level. But everyone needs something where there there is a struggle. And actually, to be honest. That's what I want from people when they do a vinyasa practice with me. I don't want people to have fun. You know, I might tell a few jokes, blah, 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 but I don't want it to be inherently a fun experience. Yeah. I think there's lots of things you can do in life that offer fun. But I think there's very, things you, very few things you can do in life that offer you mm, a challenge point. that you can yeah. keep your mind and breath steady through. So that's what I want from people when they come to practice with me. I want them to find subjective challenge, regulate their reaction to that. And if they do, can do it on a yoga mat, they are increasingly able to do it in life. Yeah, good point. Good point. 
can you what was the most challenging yoga experience you can remember in relation to feeling like have i found my edge am i at my you know i don't think i ever really have Mm. I don't think I've ever had that. You know, of course, you know, doing hot yoga, you're you know, often you, you need to think about leaving the room, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is very subjective, and I, I guess it's it's, a, it's an entirely different feeling to let's say running a marathon and really struggling and wondering can yeah. you literally take another step? Yeah. Because you know, if you even if you're doing a very intense asana, you know it's just a case of you know putting your foot down. If yeah. you're in an inversion, that's a great you know, point. <laughs> you know, case, even if you're in the deepest warrior two, you know, and I always say warrior two should get harder as you do more yoga, as you understand what you should be mm -hmm. doing in the pose. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in a really engaged warrior two, I could probably be only there for 10 full breaths if I'm really in it. But if I went to 50% to look at me, you wouldn't notice any difference. Like the pose would look the same. Yep. The internal engagement and stretch would be different. Yeah. And so I guess that is where yoga is, is different. It's not the optimal way to find a deep challenge, yeah. especially if you're fit and bendy and strong. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I think for most people, there is a subjective challenge that can be offered, even if that's actually being still. And for a lot of people, the hardest thing is to be still in Shavasana. And yeah. that's where it needs, where yeah. it needs to encounter yeah. challenge. But yeah. it's not in any way the same as yeah. being in a boxing ring yeah, running 100 yeah. kilometers or like it's not the same thing it's not better or worse it's different yeah. yeah good good point have you tried long-term meditation sits so i i've never done like a, uh, a meditation retreat yeah like I a or yeah yeah i've yeah. never done that yeah i i feel I and mean, i feel a lot of things like that people are drawn to them when they when when things are falling apart a little bit mm, yeah when they need, yeah. When they need uh -huh. some kind of significant change yeah and i could be wrong this could be just you know i'm english and english people tend to put things down a little bit we, kind of, <laughs> we, we perhaps regulate that's our, a thing <laughs> yeah yeah it's a thing it's a stiff upper <laughs> lip you can't see what we feel as much you know i always feel like anyone in, who is from the states just by looking at them or just hearing them you know exactly what's going through their mind all the time they're very open whereas english people don't tend to do that we suppress okay. things uh -huh. so i've never felt even in like deep moments of my life let's say there was a moment a period where i broke up with someone i broke my leg i got attacked uh my father passed away uh, i had to sell all his house and deal with that because my mom and dad had separated uh they were still friends but they'd separated uh I had to deal with all of this stuff and then you know my ex took the dog etc and that was all in the space of like two months a two month period yeah. uh, and then still trying to teach yoga actually because I still needed yeah. money I still needed to bring some income in so running around London via Uber and even during that I feel that the long term yoga practice helped me respond to things as they were and be okay with them yeah. so it was a combination of having an nice. English stiffer for lip but yeah. also I was served by the fact I'd had a long term yoga practice Meaning at no point did I ever feel the need to like, I just need to get away or yeah. I need to just to go deeper in myself. Something I also did when I was younger, I, I walked across Spain, uh, something called the Camino de Santiago, which 800 kilometer walk. You know, that, that really that you did that. that looked am that's amazing. That sounds it, really that, cool. It was. And that, that really changed me, especially for a 20 year old, 21 year old. Yeah. Yeah. Was. yeah. Doing that alone was a really formative experience. So although I can see the value for many people of the passengers and the like, mm -hmm. and I'd be intrigued by it, mm -hmm. there's never been a point in my life where I've had that calling. Yeah. And it's the yeah. same thing, you know, with like ayahuasca trips and mm -hmm. the like. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the value of them, but I've never had the calling. And part of me has always thought as well, like, I think I'm okay. I don't want to risk that. I don't want to like do an ayahuasca trip and then want to leave my family <laughs> or something. Like things are good. <laughs> yeah. Things are okay. Or not even if things aren't good, yeah. I have things under control internally. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I see the value, but yeah. and I'm sure maybe I will want to do it at some point, but I've never had the calling to do it. I love yeah. this. I, I love that you said that. I think that's amazing because um, it's a really good point when things are actually going good. You know, it, it takes a lot of... I don't know if it, we could say it takes a lot of work for things to be good because if things are going good, 
is that just us relaxing and us not trying to make things so good? So I guess when it is good, you just don't want to mess with that, you yeah. know. Like, and I I do agree with you about that. Well, in relation to the the you know plant medicine experience, you know, there is that risk that we'll have some sort of realization that might cause us like we have to change everything or mm-hmm. got to do everything differently. And so I, I really am enjoying hearing you f- that you feel that way. That's that's a that's a good place to be. Yeah, no, it is, and and, and I really think it's just due to a long long-term self-work yeah. yeah and and all i said the contributing factors you know beyond having a loving family and the like were martial arts as a very young person boxing probably from the age of 18 to 27 and being you know being in, working hard as a boxer pushing myself every day and having that athletic mindset you know to run all over london uh a work ethic that's come from maybe my Catholic Irish background <laughs> and the guilt if you're not working hard, plus yeah. you know, studying philosophy from the age of 18 and then doing, uh, doing yoga really from the age of kind of 19 in some form. Yeah. All of these things have really helped. And I'm never a fan also of quick change. I think in the modern world, people want things quick. You know, if people want to do a yoga teacher training after six months of doing yoga. People want to learn a handstand in a three-hour workshop and be good at a handstand then. Everyone wants things quick. You know, you see people come back from some sort of yoga teacher trainings, you know, coming back, like putting themselves on a pedestal as if they're su- spiritually superior to everyone else. It's like, you've, you've, only, you've been in Bali for three weeks. That's it. <laughs> uh, you, haven't, you haven't had some profound change. So actually, I think the, mo- the biggest change in life it doesn't look good. It doesn't look dramatic. Uh, it's just in the background, consistently done every day, every minute. Mm. That's where the real work happens, and it isn't glamorous. Yeah. It's photogenic. <laughs> Great point, Adam. I love it. Are I, you love anatomy. How do, how do you go about continuing education in anatomy? What I feel like personally, I love anatomy, and I have to keep studying it to remember it. Do you... I do uh, where are you at with say your intellectual understanding of anatomy and then your actual experience of anatomy? And and, and there was, I like I like the fact you said that because there's a massive difference. And I think I often see you know, deep yoga anatomy teachers, you know, people that call themselves anatomy specialists, and they are they know so much about the body, but they sometimes become a bit detached from what it's like to actually teach a class. Uh, and teach normal people and you have to balance that out so you can have all the anatomical knowledge in the world but it, w- what you describe is only if you're teaching often teaching someone who has the same anatomical knowledge in the world and has a strong bendy body let's take an example of putting your foot on the knee in tree pose okay so for years people have said don't do it don't do it it will you know it will hurt the knee don't do it yeah <laughs> But then now people are saying the opposite, like Alan Tom, think actually it's fine. It's stupid, this cube. You know, any yoga teacher that tells you that is bad. But actually the answer is neither of those things. Because yes, the knee can twist. And the knee can take force from the side. But there's four of the places on the leg you could put your foot more effectively. If you put your foot on the inner calf or the inner thigh, you can really let the leg push back with a good amount of force, which will then help you externally rotate the top leg a little bit more. There's just no need to put it on the knee. And actually, if someone is a little bit weak in that area and doesn't have a good grasp of what's going on in their body, maybe something could go wrong. And that's, and that's sometimes a difference. So I am, I'm a big fan of you know, anatomy knowledge, but I think my speciality is trying to take general anatomical understanding and help people teach in a more informed way that's less likely to hurt people and is more likely to keep their students safe. Yeah. Okay. And it's and what I try and take into account is the average student. And yeah. often the average student doesn't even know what their bicep is. They don't need to, but like, like a lot of people, yeah. if I say, if I said to them, you know, be mindful of not dropping and compressing your supraspinatus. You know, wonderful. If I Yes, let's say the transition from 
what were your three to half moon? Mm -hmm. Most people have said it's bad for a long time, but then now there's a whole wave of, no, it's fine. Your body can do that. Because and of yes, hip, your body can do hip, that. Hip rotation, just so yeah. someone will understand, like some warrior three, you're balancing on your, say, your right leg, your left leg's behind you, your arms are forward, and then you'd put your, say, right hand on the floor and then lift your left hip up. When yeah. you're saying that, the argument yeah. is that long term, that can be bad on the hip. Well, that's what a lot, so a lot of people say, you, know, you should never teach that. Yeah. And then there's a lot of counter now saying, no, it's fine. Any teacher that tells you you shouldn't ever teach that is a bad teacher. <laughs> and, the, and actually, it's again more nuanced. Like yeah. if yeah. on that standing leg, my belief is if you bend the leg, turn on the glutes, stabilize that area, then turn out, you're probably fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But most students won't do that. They'll lock the leg and then try and clunk it which actually probably isn't the best thing Yeah, for the cartilage, right? Like you, you yeah. hear about hip replacements and we, we start to wonder at when we hit our sixties and seventies, like is the stuff we're doing now, what kind of effect will it have down the road? Mm. Like I think if I worked with a student every day, I would let them do that kind of transition because they'd have got strong and stable and have a good understanding. Yeah. In an average yeah. drop in class. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just so many other things we could do. We yeah. don't need to be. So that's my view of yoga anatomy is that, you know, I'm constantly learning. I'm trying to, I try and learn from other modalities as well. I think there's often a lot of dogma in yoga. You know, so I'll look at people who are physios yeah. teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one, the one thing I would say to anyone listening in terms of increasing your knowledge of anatomy relative to, your, to yoga and moving the body, really make sure you look at who you're learning from. Okay. Because anyway, anyone can put anything on the internet now. You know, anyone can potentially you know, call themselves a doctor, you know, not even you know, not a doctor, yep. let's say, but like a nutritionist, yep. right? There is, there is no guidance on who can call themselves a nutritionist or not. You have one nutritionist that has studied a degree and did a PhD and someone else that's done an online course for two weeks. Yep. Uh, you just have to be very careful. Yeah, yeah good point. Who you're, and it, but the same with yoga teaching. Yep. You know, you, if you go to some places, all you need to do is keep breathing for two weeks and you get a yoga certificate providing you pay. All you, you, know? all you need to do is keep breathing. <laughs> you could have gone to a training. All you had to do is keep breathing. <laughs> and you have a piece of paper. And you didn't have to listen. You didn't have yeah, to, exactly. you didn't have that, to that, that any information. The you didn't so maybe just, have to do any yoga. You you could that's hilarious, dude. I love it. You just have to I think you just have to be careful who you're yeah. learning from. Yeah. And where possible, kind of look into their background a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, Adam. I saw a photo that you have on your Instagram where it was a, it's a cool visual. It's like overhead. It looks like you're teaching in a, a large uh, yoga event. The mats are lined up perfectly. Everyone's in the pose nicely and it's kind of looking down. When you're teaching a large event like that, what are you thinking? You know, in relation to everything that you've you've spoke about, like if you get to work with someone on a daily basis and you feel confident that you're able to convey the information that you think will be helpful for them, then you feel comfortable bringing them into that, say, warrior three to, mm. to half moon shape. When you're leading a larger event like that, where you have no, you know, you haven't had a chance to talk with everybody and find out what's going on uh, with them personally, how do you structure your class and what kind of things are you thinking about in relation to that? So the, I think the fir my first answer to that is that every yoga class you teach, really is an open level yoga class and you know even if you ask about injuries you've got no way of knowing everything that's going on in everyone's body yep. so that's what i mean when i talk about the average reasonable person when you teach a class you know unless it is a one-to-one -one, you just have to work out what's going on for people by observing them and trying to make sure you're giving cues that are supporting everyone and giving cues that don't suggest hierarchy like good people do this Mm. And better people do this. Mm. If you can't do that, do this. You instead offer invitations to go further. That's one thing I would say to that. It's good uh, I, I love teaching big events. You know, I, that's, that's probably my favorite style of teaching. But it is a bit of a combination of yoga teaching plus entertainment. In big, that one is actually in a really big museum in the UK called Equinox. Uh, and, you know, most people weren't there for the yoga, particularly. They were kind of. But it wasn't like a yoga conference. You know, it was a cool event in a cool museum where they got early access to a gallery. So what I'm doing is just teaching an all-level class where I recycle a few jokes. 
and just do what I can to make sure everyone is kind of safe and everyone has a bit of stretch of most areas and a bit of engagement and a bit of sweat. Yeah. That's, that's kind of all, all, all I want in that situation. You know, when you're teaching a big conference style class, mm -hmm. you know, people are really there for the yoga. So you are, and I will often say at the beginning, guys, you know, you've all read the description of this workshop. You all know what you signed up for. Uh, you know, adapt as you need, but I'm going to presume you all to some degree know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and often just intro with that. That's a great answer. When you're leading teacher trainings now, because I'm gathering there's probably, well, you, you've had a chance to see what's going on in the yoga world, what works, what doesn't. Uh, what is your, what are you putting your emphasis on with the students? Like, what are you finding you want to impart the most so my, to your trainers, trainees? My preference is teaching CPDs, actually. So shorter form CPDs is my preference. Uh, and they, Can you define CBD, um, CPD? <laughs> C, uh, continuing education. Oh, thank you. Continuing Sorry. Education. Yep. So not 300 hour trainings, not 200 hour, but mm -hmm. eight hour, 50 hour, 100 hour mentorings, uh, et cetera. Yep, got uh, it. What I tend to want people to, so I, I don't want to pe teach people the Adam Hustler yoga strategy. <laughs> what I want people to learn or what I want to cultivate is an ability to ask why and what. You know, and a lot of people, I think a lot of teachers, new teachers, teach in a certain way just because that's what they've been told to do. And in their 200 hour training, they were told that this is the only way. And they give cues without understanding why they're giving that cues. They teach poses without really understanding what the pose is trying to do. You know, it almost becomes just like a, a shape replication. So I want people to actually ask why and what and be critical of the way they teach. Anyway, as I am of myself all the time. So that's what I'm cultivating through my trainings. I, I, don't, have, I, so, I don't care if people teach yeah. like me or not, yeah. but I want people to have intention for everything they do and say in class. Nice. Good answer. What philosophy are you intrigued by currently? So over the, oh, well, over the years, a little bit. Stoicism. I was into stoicism, stoicism. before. Yeah. Well, it was cool. Long be <laughs> before it was cool. Before uh, I'm reading, a, I'm reading the, the Daily Stoic right now, and uh, yeah, I, I know so, it's trendy right now. So you you were onto it. Uh, so I was onto it like 15 years ago. Uh, yeah. I started yeah. off with Seneca, Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, uh, and it helped me so much. And at the, bizarrely, when I first kind of started yoga, that uh, teaching, I was like, shall I be Adam Hustler Yoga, or shall I call my website like Stoic Yoga? Yeah. Uh, that was genuinely a thought. I was going to be like the stoic <laughs> yogi. I should probably should have done that. In Dude, that that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> I like it. I like uh, it. Or maybe actually that's a little bit of cultural appropriation because I am fusing two cultures. So maybe that's actually not the best idea. But anyway. What? Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I did think that at the time. So that, that's always captured my attention a little bit. I'm doing something at the moment. Uh, there's an online program called Heroic. Heroic? Uh, I forget the name of the guy who runs it. But what he does is he takes books in the philosophical world, the motivation, like books are, are designed to make your life better in some sense. And he breaks them down. He does notes on them. He, uh, a lot of these books are philosophy books. So each day I'm exposed to a new philosopher or a new book that is interpreting philosophy or a new guide to live life. Yeah, so that's this thing called heroic. Mm. Uh, and I'm really, really into that at the moment. Very cool. I guess the biggest influence in my life right now, perhaps, is the school of life, it's called, by modern philosopher Alain de Bottom. Uh, uh, so he is... School of life. Written, yeah. yeah. He's written some really... It's actually not Alain, it's Alain. But he's written some really good books, uh, about you know, religion and the like, but then he created this thing called the School of Life. The idea being that in the Hellenistic philosophy era, most of philosophy was telling you how to live. And then, then it went a very different direction. And you know, the Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer, etc. It all went in a very different direction. It was all about like questioning existence and the like. Uh, and actually, he he said this is missing in the modern world using kind of philosophy to help us live in a better way. So the book I'm reading at the moment is How to Be a Good Enough Parent by the School of Life. Nice. Uh, 
which is incredible. Yeah, it's really. Thank you cool. for the recommendation. I gotta check it out. That sounds really good. Mm, they've got so, they've got so much, so much content out there now. Uh, none of it's by any kind of named individual anymore. It's just by the school of life. Excellent. I can't wait to check that out. When I was uh, driving in this morning, I'm, I am listening on Audible to A Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. Yeah. And um, I haven't read him before. And it's narrated by a British narrator and really well done and pulling me into like, I guess, a, a, a 1900s Britain? No, late 1800s. Mm. Wow. Just the idea of the horse and buggy going up a hill and the mist and the and the just made me think well it got me excited because i was like cool i'm gonna get i get to talk to somebody who lives in england can you share a little bit about your appreciation for growing up or having that heritage uh what it feels like to grow up in 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 england and in relation to like histor history mm. and where you so are my, my, my house was built in the 1750s wow the house you live in the yeah, cottage yeah. that you talked about yeah, yeah you, when you said cottage and in the country and and you know, have, have, you, have, you, have you seen the, um, the film The Holiday? That popular Christmas film is Cameron Diaz. It's quite old now, Jude Law. Oh, it sounds so familiar. It's, it's a kind of film that Jack Black is played every year yeah. at Christmas, but that's actually the British section of it. It's half in Britain, half in the States. Yeah. It's actually where we live. Oh, uh, what? Oh, live in, in, the, in the town, in the area that you live? Yeah, yeah. All right, All right I'll check it out. In. I'll go watch uh, it again. But like, you know, obviously being brought up in every country, that's in any country, that's all you know, you know that, that becomes your norm. But, you know, as someone that has traveled a lot, I really appreciate the history that's all around us in most British cities. And of course, some are newer. But if you go through London, you know, every build, all the streets, like a lot of the plant, the streets in London, I know like in America, it's all grids. In London, it makes no sense. Like it was all the streets and like, like the land was split up by, a, I forget which king it was, or, but they split it up in such, and, and it's pretty much stayed the same. So all these roads that kind of weave in and out that make no sense everywhere. It's been the same way for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years. And then you look around and you see a beautiful modern building and you'll see a building that's 400 years old. Yeah. Uh, there was just so much depth to living in this country. Uh, and, you know, of course, there's lots of poverty, as there is in every country. Uh, but, you know, th and, you know, there's many people that don't get to go out of their immediate area. But the moment you leave a city like London yeah. and you explore, you know, the beautiful, beautiful villages that the country is scattered with. And there, there is nowhere I would, I would rather live than the UK, particularly where I am now. Uh, I love, I, I live in a place called Surrey, is a county, about 40 minutes train ride from london yep. but you know, sometimes to drive into london takes half an hour but there's nowhere in the world i'd rather live beautiful rolling hillsides we have vineyards uh so many old stunning properties true english villages nice pubs people that say hello to each other uh yeah there's nowhere i'd rather live in the world i love that picture you painted i've never been so i can't wait to I can't wait to go. I've, I've landed in the airport, but my wife doesn't let me count airport landings as a actual country visit. I I lived in London for, for 20 minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Uh, get, get here if you can. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable place. And there is nowhere. There's nowhere like it on earth. You know, I always say, you know, because I travel to a lot of cities, there's no other city I could live in except London. Mm. It's either London or the countryside. There's yeah. no city yeah. I could live in. So I'd always compare it to London. That's cool, man. I am so thankful for you to niche out some time to chat with me. And you were so gracious. I, you know, messed up our times. I was here early. And then, you know, I, you, st you stuck in here with me while I was out <laughs> for you. So no at all. that is really appreciated because, um, you know, and you don't know me from the man of the moon. You're willing to to do this interview with me. Uh, can you speak a little bit, though, from an inspirational side? You have a podcast as well. Can you share um, a little bit about what you enjoy about podcasting, what you've learned through the process and any maybe trade secrets or tips that you'd be willing to share with 
myself yeah. and the listeners. <laughs> so what I'd say first and foremost is to really make a podcast successful. It is kind of a full-time job and we don't do that. So, you know, our podcast, I think could get so bigger and have so much more reach. We just don't have the time to push it. Yeah. One of my guests and acquaintances called Chris Williamson. Uh, you know, when I first met him like five years ago, he was plugging the podcast, his podcast called Modern Wisdom. And he was doing five episodes a week. Wow. Five episodes a week. Yep. And then we're recording all the videos, pushing it out there, uh, building his skills to become a better podcaster. So he would do, uh, what, what did he do? He did like uh, stand up comedy courses, improv wow. comedy courses, et cetera, wow. to become better at what he does. So he cool. He researches each guest. And lately, he was, he was a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast. Wow. And he's had guests like Jordan Peterson on. He's just booming. I and mean, there's a yeah. high chance yeah. you've seen him you know, on an Instagram reel yeah. or a like. You've seen his face, Chris Williamson. And so I think to really make it, it is a full-time job. And most podcasts don't get beyond episode 10. Yeah. Most yeah. don't last a year. Yeah. Because uh, it is work. And often you don't see that. And people talk about getting sponsored. But the reality is, you know, unless you're really pushing it, it's very hard to get significant sponsorship. Yeah. unless you have investors initially. Yeah. Uh, and then equally, actually, I'm going to be being a, bit, a little bit negative. Like Instagram isn't the best place to promote it. Like, you know, for me, if I post for any podcast episode on my Adam Hustler Instagram, mm. that post dies. Like, no one sees it compared to other posts. No one's that interested in it. Or, you know, it's text-based. It looks like a flyer. No one, because it's very, very hard to build. Do, do you think, do you I think love it. Uh, I, I, cool. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you. No, my apologies. I was going to say, I love it's such a. I love the conversations we have, yeah. and it is so. Yeah. And, you, and you know, when you do podcasts, you forget that people listen. So to travel and someone say, "Oh, I love that episode." Oh, like you forget that anyone's yeah. actually listened to it, and they're going, you see the numbers, <laughs> but there's no real interaction. So it's such a delight when people say they've listened to yeah. it, uh, and, and it's such a treat to have conversations with incredible people. Uh, so yeah, I, I absolutely love it and will continue doing it for a long time. That's I just cool. wish I had time and resource to actually, uh, push it harder. Yeah. I hear you. That's a, it, it is really fun. I feel like I started my ride on March of 2020 when the pandemic was like uh, officially real. And, um, I feel like it helped me get through that period because I was able to speak with teachers all over the world. And, you know, my wife and I have a studio here in Florida. We just celebrated our, our 17 year anniversary yesterday uh, at the Congrats. studio. And, um, you know, there was a, I, I didn't want to let the studio go. And so to be able to hear what other people are doing around the world, for me, it was like an incredibly therapeutic experience. So mm. I, I love doing this and, uh, and I love, I'm so appreciative that you're, you're willing to share with me, you know, and talk with me like that. I think it, it's an amazing thing when to reach out to somebody who, who you don't know and to have them say, yeah, like that's, to me, that builds faith in the world, you know, or hu in humanity that. Well, we, I would I, like to, to <laughs> me, I would, I would never say no uh, to things. It's, like, I will say no to some things, but if it's people wanting <laughs> genuine conversation, I would say yeah. no. If people are asking me to advertise their stuff for no money. Yeah. Then I say that. And I get that quite a lot. Being like, oh, but it's not very really yogic of you to want payment. It's, like, yeah. it's not very really yogic of you to charge money for that. <laughs> so, in, <laughs> so, yeah, in, in, in those situations, when, when people want to use something I've built yeah. for free, I yeah. say no, unless it's a charity. No. Uh, but if people are just wanting conversations oh. in good faith, no. Uh, no, I'm always happy to always, always, always happy to have that. And I think you know, it's not all about money. Uh, you know, we're, we're not we haven't become yoga teachers because we want to be millionaires. Uh, although I think maybe increasingly some people <laughs> think, yeah, we are, the yoga teaching lifestyle is a glamorous one. Uh, the reality is for many yoga teachers, it's a really hard life. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, many of the people we see on Instagram probably are making okay money through different means, but the average yoga teacher is probably finding things quite hard Yeah. because, you know, yeah. the worst way to make money as a teacher is to teach in a studio. But it's really important to teach in a studio. I, I still teach in a studio yep. because it's how I grow as a teacher. It's how I connect to students. Yep. Uh, but, but, and I think it should be low pay solely because there isn't much money coming in. Like yep. It's not like yoga studios are making millions of pounds. Yep. It, you know, most yoga studios are probably breaking even. Yep. Uh, 
but the reality is, you know, teaching yoga studios doesn't earn a lot. Getting privates can be quite hard uh, yeah, and is very true. relatively unstable. Teaching corporates, finding them again can be hard. It's quite competitive. Uh, so I love teaching yoga and I'll continue to teach it. But I think, you know, yoga teachers need all the support they can get. And if I can offer any of that oh. through channels like this or just through social media, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Well, thank you, Adam. It is greatly appreciated. <clears throat> I have a bunch more questions, but I want to respect your time. In closing, is there anything you would like to, any stoic wisdom beyond what you've already shared? <laughs> it doesn't have to be stoic. It can be any kind of wisdom. Is there anything you'd like to say in, in closing for, for our listeners? I would say make sure, I've been doing this a lot lately, try and find places that make you feel insignificant <laughs> in a really, in a good way, in a good way, make you realize that you are just a temporary wave in this ocean, which is often kind of an analogy used in the Buddhist world, that we are all just waves that pop up for a brief period, but we're all part of the ocean. We are kind of wave, brief waves with an ego. But yeah, finding things or places that make you feel insignificant, that could be going into a dark area and looking at the night sky. It could be, you know, standing on the edge of the ocean, just looking out. Uh, things that bring you awe in that sense. I think especially if you live in a city, you can become a little bit self-absorbed. If, if, you're, if you don't access big green space, if you can't see the stars, if all you see are the buildings around you, then you can think the world revolves around you a little bit. So I think to put things in perspective is important. Uh, and yeah, and finding awe through stuff like the ocean or the stars or the mountains, I think is really, a really valuable thing. I think it's important we keep that in check. And it puts everything into perspective. All your worries, it puts into perspective. It puts your ego in check. It's just so valuable in so many ways. Awesome, Adam. This has been such a pleasure, man. I, I, I'm really appreciative to have this chance to meet you. And I hope to travel to London. And when I do, I'm definitely going to come look you up, come take class. Cool. <laughs> look forward and, to seeing uh, you there. All right, man. Thank you so much. Until next time. Yeah, man. Have a good one. All right, you too. Thank you.